Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is uh, Matthew Pullen. I'm one of the directors here at the HealthSpan show. Uh, we're really excited this afternoon to be hosting a session in partnership with uh, Business for Health uh, and looking forward to uh, a healthy discussion over the next hour. A couple of quick housekeeping points. Uh, for those of you that are watching live uh, via Zoom, please can you post any questions uh, that you have for the panelists in the Q&A function uh, as opposed to the chat function, that will be much appreciated. Uh, some of you will be watching the session on demand at a later date via our swap call platform. Uh, hello to, to all of you as well, of course. We're really lucky this afternoon uh, to have Tina Woods as our moderator. Uh, many of you already know Tina, I'm sure. Uh, amongst uh, a plethora of, of roles and achievements, Tina is uh, founder and CEO of Collider Health uh, and works with National AHSN AI Network, uh, NHS X AI Lab, uh, and UK Research and Innovation on the Healthy Aging Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Tina is also Secretariat Director of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Longevity and, of course, CEO for um, Business for Health as well. The perfect person, I'm sure you'll agree, to guide us through today's discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back to Tina uh, to kick us off. Over to you, Tina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, yes, good job on, on describing all the ridiculous number of hats I, I wear at any given time. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, um, at this session today. Really pleased that you're here on this incredibly important uh, subject on business, the role of business in leveling up health. Um, I will very quickly introduce you to our, uh, our, our fantastic panelists um, in a moment, um, but very, very quickly, uh, the reason why we're here today um, is to look at the role of business in contributing to the health to the health of our nation. Uh, following the, the launch, some of you may have been at the launch about a month ago now um, at the Leveling Up Health launch that the APPG for Longevity um, ran, which um, uh, had um, our Secretary of State, Matt Hancock, Chris Whitty, our Chief Medical Officer, and Henry Dimbleby, who's leading the National Food Strategy. Um, they're supporting uh, the launch of this uh, important report um, on um, emerging out of COVID, how, what, what we can do to, to really level up health um, and uh, deal with some of the important issues in terms of the nation's poor health. So we have a whole plan around that. But very, very specifically today, we're looking at the, the significant and a very important and growing role of business in contributing um, uh, positively to the nation's health and delivering on the manifesto commitment to five extra years of healthy life expectancy while minimizing health inequalities. Um, so our, our panelists are going to um, outline the different ways in which business can contribute to health. Um, and uh, very, very importantly, and I will just click now, um, some of you will see this on Twitter and LinkedIn and all the rest of it, but we are have just launched a survey for the business index, which is um, um, a, a very important piece of work that we're launching to measure business contribution of health. So I encourage everyone who's attending today and, and uh, virtually and what have you, um, uh, you know, off, offline um, uh, to, to, to contribute to this, uh, this survey. It's a very, very important piece of work and we do need to hear from the business community. Um, so, uh, so very, very um, uh, quickly, I will, uh, our panelists will, will give their perspective um, sort of a couple of minutes or so in terms of where they see and what they've been doing um, in terms of the, uh, the business uh, contribution to health. Uh, and then we're going to engage in, in a conversation. So I really do encourage people to send their, their questions on the, the Q&A channel because we want this, this isn't meant to be a conversation. I've got loads of questions I can pull out of the bag, but this is, this is, this is for you um, who are here today. So very, very quickly, and, I, and we'll go in turn to our, our, our panelists. We've got John Godfrey, who is my co-director at Business for Health and also wears the hat of Corporate Affairs Director at Legal in General. Um, so he's the chair of Business for Health and he will um, uh, uh, ex uh, explain sort of his view on what where we could really make uh, an impact um, in this space. Um, we've got Dr. Annabelle Bentley, who is the Chief Medical Officer at AXA Health, who are also a founding member of Business for Health. Um, we also have Mary Bright, who is Head of Social Affairs um, from the Phoenix Group, who are also a founding member of Business for Health. Um, and we also have Jess Attard, um, who is Head of Health and Food at Share Action, um, who has been incredibly successful with their work in the health and food um, space uh, in terms of really um, uh, getting a attention on, on the role of business here um, from um, an ESG perspective. Uh, so I'm going to go in turn, let everyone uh, share their perspective on why this is so important and why it's so timely as well. And I'll start with John. So over to you, John. Yeah, hello. Thanks very much, Tina. The, uh, my start point on this really is that health equals wealth. 
And you know, that, that was shown in a dramatic fashion through COVID with the, the pandemic and the economic knock-on effects of that, which hopefully we will uh, come through fairly soon and recover from. Um, but it was there before. And uh, what we see, for example, when we look at the north-south divide in the UK, uh, is uh, academic work which suggests that a third of the productivity gap between the north and the south uh, is accounted for by difference in, differences in health outcomes. So we need to tackle this in order to get the economy moving better. Um, it's uh, in all of our interests to do that, including business. Why does business have to play a role? Well, uh, our economy is roughly speaking 40% public sector, 60% private sector. Uh, and so clearly there is a big role for business as part of that, as the driver of that 60% of the economy. Um, Business interacts with health in a number of ways. I mean, the first way is as an employer. You know, what do you do to uh, encourage better health among your uh, workforce? Uh, second, uh, it's as a provider of products and services. Do your products and services uh, add to or deplete from population health? What is it you're making or selling or, or, or servicing? And then the third piece is as an investor and an innovator. And you know, business can do an awful lot in this space because it is through businesses, often in collaboration with academia and government in positive, constructive collaboration, that you see these big advances happening. And we saw that again, absolutely uh, in COVID through the vaccination program. So there's a huge role for business. Uh, I think there's also a massive uh, parallel with what we've seen in climate. Um, like carbon emissions, uh, health emissions, if you like, are externalities. Businesses do things they don't generally uh, pay for them. Taxpayers do. At some point, governments attempted or will be tempted to push back on some of those things. So far, it's only been on egregious things uh, like opioids in the States. Uh, or I've oh, lost John. Have lost John. <laughs> Um, unless he comes back in the next few seconds, we might go to Annabelle next. Um, Big decision. Oh, there we, there he comes back. John, we missed oh. we missed you for a few seconds there. We got to the opioids. Did you? Oh, right. <laughs> opioids. Yes, I, I was just saying that um, the, the, the government regulation and taxation and so on has really only tackled egregious cases. This will broaden out. And it's in business's interests and the interests of investors as part of their risk management to aim off for these. You already see improved performance from some companies which are good at this versus those which aren't. I can give examples later on. Yes. But uh, that's the role. And the role of business for health is to try and develop some of the metrics because what gets measured gets done. And we want to help business on this journey. Absolutely. So that's great, John. Thanks for setting the scene there. Um, and we'll go into more detail about um, the, the H and ESHG um, that we want to, to get in there. Um, so, uh, so Annabelle, we're going to come to you next. Annabelle, over to you. Oh, we can't hear you for some reason. Hmm. I can't hear Annabelle either. Hmm. Well, we might do, Annabelle, you might just need to adjust your um, device settings. So well, we'll, Annabelle does what we'll that. Do, well, we'll go to Mary first. Yeah, we'll go to Mary while we figure that out. Okay, yeah, Annabelle's saying she's going to do something. Okay, um, thank you, Tina. I think you know, I agree with, with what John was saying. I think I've come at this from a slightly different angle. So I think about, uh, as a business, we look at what the macro trends are, what the risks and opportunities are, what, and what that means for us. So globally, we have a macro trend of increasing life expectancy. What that means for businesses is um, multiple. We need to adapt as society changes, and society needs to adapt to that reality as well. The level of change that we're seeing, and um, you know, the, the report highlights that the the average age already having increased by 10 years, life expectancy having increased on a trajectory year after year, but healthy life expectancy not having moved. But that, that presents some real challenges for business. 
but it also creates massive opportunities. So when I think about you know, why should businesses not, why should businesses embrace it? I still think, why wouldn't you? Um, because you have the potential to tap into an enormous amount of um, talent, wealth, new business opportunities, innovation, all of that comes from this changing trend. So I think the businesses who change and adapt early will be those who are successful. Um, I don't know any business that doesn't look at it at its um, the strategic trends around it. So when we've got this position, I think we really need to be to be anticipating those changes and looking at, at where we can work to optimize them. Um, and it, it, it's a great example ESG. And if I just think about one aspect of it, um, it was 10 years ago that it was um, really quite left field to be thinking of investing in your ethical funds and there were real question marks over performance. Now it's the other way around and we're seeing, yeah. and we're quite assured that ESG funds have a better return or mm -hmm. as good. And that's because the societal purpose is aligning, getting up. That's the growth area. So I think we need yeah. to start seeing the role of business in health as the opportunity for us. Absolutely. I remember a year ago we talked about, you know, good business is good business. And mm. we're really, really starting to, to find that getting traction. Um, so uh, I think, Annabelle, you're back. I think on your, your phone, hopefully we can, we can we heard you before. So, Annabelle, do you want to go next then? Thank you, Tina. Good Thanks, afternoon, Annabelle. everybody. Yeah. I hope you can hear this time. We the peril, the peril of the mute button. Um, <laughs> If I could just start by saying, I'll introduce, as Chief Medical Officer of AXA Health, what we're interested in and our mission is to help our customers be the best version of themselves, whatever that means to them personally. So it's a commitment that we already take seriously. But when you come on to actually, what do you do about it? Where do you start? When do you start? I think those are the interesting questions. But I think the thing that's most encouraging is people's increasing recognition that businesses have a, play, a role to play in a healthier nation and a healthier nation is more productive and wealthier. So we're going in the right direction. And in terms of the areas to focus on, for me as a doctor, I think one of the most interesting areas is climate change as a source of ill health and something that needs to be tackled is one of the highest priorities so the encouraging thing there is we are already beginning to tackle that through all the carbon initiatives. So I really hope that this initiative helps that gather pace as well, because it's achieving the same aims. And I think if we were going to try and aim at something for the future, it's a, it's a combination of factors that makes a difference. Whether you call it clean or healthy, but clean air, clean food, clean energy, clean work and probably clean physical activity. All of those things help individuals be healthier, help communities be healthier, and help businesses be healthier. So those, I think, are the really key things. And the bit of work I looked at beforehand is, I think the public health doctors in particular will be looking at this, championing it from the sidelines, saying, yes, for many, many years, it's been recognised the uh, poverty, surrounding circumstances, they are a key determinant of health. And if I refer to one bit of research, which I think is interesting and understandable, I think it was the London Health Observatory, so some public health researchers who used Office of National Statistics data to generate a really helpful map. So every tube station you go east from Westminster going out of London, you lose a year of life expectancy. So again, to offer, um, to echo John's example of the north-south divide, you can see it at even smaller levels as well. So I'll end there by saying, I think there is a proven association. I'm really pleased businesses are stepping up and taking responsibility, whatever it means for their business. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That was great. And I love that image that you, that you, you um, brought up about the tube map. It's such a fabulous way of describing what can happen even in, in local areas, the inequalities. Um, so, uh, so Jess, over to you. Thanks, Tina. So I'm Jess Attard and I head up health 
at an organisation called Share Action. Um, so we're an NGO that works with the investment system in particular to drive a healthier planet and population. Um, we build uh, investor-led movements to apply pressure to companies to do better on climate, health and other social factors as well. Uh, and in do doing so, helping to build long-term resilience across investor portfolios, but also of those companies themselves. Um, so I really kind of echo, um, echo John's point about health equals wealth. That's very much um, a, a kind of ethos that, that we work with at Share Action. Um, it, we see investors increasingly recognising that beyond the moral reasons for companies um, to, to do well on ESG performance, there's also financial reasons to do that as well. Um, so companies that are overly reliant on the sale or production of harmful products and services leave themselves increasingly exposed to regulation, to tax hikes, to litigation, to reputational damage uh, so there's real risk um, and, and of course there's opportunity as well as Mary's alluded to there's a real kind of upside for doing uh, and being market leaders on health as well um, so we want to see kind of companies shifting to healthier products and services uh, that are better for the population uh, better for companies better for investors and actually our work with Tesco that, that was out in the news today and, and, and earlier in the year has demonstrated the power that shareholders can have to influence even really big companies like Tesco's to do better on health. We've helped to ensure that they've set measurable and ambitious health targets to grow their proportion of healthier sales. And, and we think that will really have tangible positive impacts on population health. So we're looking to use that to, to influence the rest of the food industry uh, and as a platform for growing our work around health. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jess. And uh, been spectacular to, to watch some of the um, success that you've had, actually, uh, at your organization with putting this all up uh, higher up the agenda. Um, so, uh, so I guess um, just before we've, we're starting to get questions from, from our audience, which is great, um, but I'm just going to ask a few more sort of general sort of scene setting questions first, uh, also to make sure uh, to, to kind of uh, create the, 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 the right context for also the, the work that we're doing with the business index. Uh, I've just, just to remind everyone, the audience, uh, I've just, I did send a link through to the business index survey. I encourage you all to, to have a look and, and fill it out because we do want to hear from you. Um, so I guess um, just a word, I I guess on the, the key the different roles of business in this because um and i don't know john if you want to answer this question because we are kind of exploring you know the, the gamut of roles of business and of course we're trying to tease out both the short and the longer term gains from these different roles in terms of our objective john do you want to just sort of set the scene with that question yeah ab absolutely i mean first as an employer um, there was interesting work done a few years ago uh, by Lord Stevenson and, and uh, Paul Farmer on the cost of mental health uh, to the workplace, and they had Deloitte's run some numbers, and the, it was astonishingly high, £35 billion, pounds, I think, was the number from memory, uh, and that, that's mental health alone, never mind physical uh, health, and this is about absence and reduced productivity and presenteeism and all these things. So, you know, Quite apart from any moral duty or ethical concerns businesses have, you know, there is a clear self-interest in having a, a, a fitter and a healthier workforce. And again, you look at the disparities in economic and health outcomes, you know, it, it is is a terrible waste of people to see people unable to work in their 50s who otherwise could be going on and uh, living more productive, fulfilled lives at work. So that's the employer bit. The, uh, the products and services bit uh, I, I think is, is really important. Um, if you look, uh, for example, across the Atlantic at the US, uh, if you think about something like opioid distribution, um, which was a perfectly legal activity uh, in, in, at the time uh, with horrific consequences, now facing massive lawsuits. If you had been a shareholder able to invest or a pension fund able to invest in some of those companies, you would be looking at ruinous outcomes for your, 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 
your pension scheme members. So, you know, there is a real impact of what happens when a lawsuit comes along or a change in regulation, a sugar tax or whatever it may be. Mm. So, so products and services, we have to watch what are going to be the health equivalents of the coal mines, the stranded assets, which turn out not to be worth very much. So that's important. And then the, the third bit that I mentioned was as in, in investors and innovators. And you know, just like with climate, you know, there are some people who will uh, do very well out of the uh, uh, attempts to mitigate climate change because they're in new climate friendly industries. And the same will happen in, in health. It already does in the life science industry. And that's very much to be encouraged. So we need to encourage, foster the upside uh, and limit the downside. One's about capital allocation, one's about risk management frameworks. So Absolutely. business is crucial. So we talk a lot about the parallels um, in terms of learning from the climate change experience, but perhaps Jess, perhaps you can just comment a little bit, A, what we can take from the climate change experience, but also uh, increasingly the interconnection between climate and, and health. Um, we talk, uh, and I know there's a concept called the one health model, which is all about this sort of, this finely attuned balance between humans, animals, and the planet. So there is this interconnection that people are also seeing. So just a word maybe on, on sort of what we can take from, from where the climate change in terms of ESG have been really successful and the interconnection that we need to also look at moving forward, particularly now that the COP, um, you know, uh, G7, COP26 and all the rest of it, what we could be looking at in terms of the synergies there. Yeah, there's absolutely loads of interconnection. I mean, one of the ones that we kind of work on most closely is around creating a healthier shift uh, in terms of people's diets and what they're eating and of course mm -hmm. people eating more kind of plant-based based products tends to be better better from a climate perspective as well similarly uh, air pollution is one of the largest um, killers um, uh, of people worldwide and you know very linked um, into into climate so so there's real kind of overlaps and synergies there um, and, and what we're really interested in is seeing whilst uh, climate is a really key part of this sort of ESG framework that investors and, and companies are, are working to we've seen that kind of grow uh, grow and expand over the last sort of decade uh, and more and really we think that that health in itself population health isn't so much of a different uh, issue to climate and actually there's, there's lots of similarities um, we're further behind on the journey in getting companies and investors to recognize the importance of population health to have the data that we need to measure company performance on health um, to have that embedded into ESG frameworks and so on um, but we want to we want to really help um, start that movement of investors and companies doing much more on health, uh, following a similar kind of trajectory to, to what we've seen happen with climate. Fantastic. Thank you, Jess. Um, so I'm going to start picking through threads. I'm, I'm having a look at um, sort of the chat as well. I, I, I always get distracted by it, but there's some really interesting uh, people coming through with their experiences looking at um, productivity gaps from North and South, etc. for example, from the, the NHS uh, uh, networks there. Um, there's a question here, and I, I'll briefly try and answer, and then I'm going to turn to Mary on this point from Lynn Bardell. And I'm going to talk about technology in a minute and maybe bring in Annabelle uh, as well on this. But um, so we've got a question here from Lynn. Uh, so forgive me if I've missed the point, but where but where in leveling up health is mental health and mental well-being, please? So I think that was a reference uh, to the leveling up health report um, that was uh, launched last month. We had five key priorities and I've had a few comments uh, and a couple of places like um, activity and also mental health not being on there um, uh, as one of the five priorities. Uh, John had mentioned the huge cost of mental health on business as well and, and, to, and to society. We've already seen the McKinsey reports talking about the huge burden of ill health um, on business, but also a society at large. Um, so just to make a point that it's not that mental health, obviously, I mean, mental health is hugely important. Of course, it's connected also with physical health. It's not that it's not important. It just it just didn't um, make our sort of top five, as it were, through lots of discussion in terms of immediate priorities. Now, you may argue with that, but there are various reasons for that. Um, but uh, and also, I think there's a point and maybe Mary, um, there's a whole role about what employers can do in terms of unpaid care, supporting those who have these, um, you know, difficult sort of caring commitments and what 
the workplace and uh, can can do to, to that. And I, I don't know if you'd like to sort of answer that question, because I know you wear the hat. Um, uh, head of social care at the Phoenix Group, just and there's there's been a lot of been a lot of discussion about that as well. And John, you might want to also mention a few points on that because I know that's an area close to you as well. But um, Mary, do you want to pick up on that point? Yeah, thank you, Tina. And I think this this goes back to that perspective on increasing long longevity. So we know that thirty percent of the working age population is over fifty, and when we when we look at what that actually means, and I I use the analogy of feminism and equality. So in the 1970s, we started seeing women being able to get paid maternity leave that gradually increased with the right to return to employment. We didn't expect um, women to either stop work because they had care responsibilities for child and um, nor to never work again, but that only gradually became the place. Now, in our current decade, we need to make that same change for people who have caring responsibilities at the other end of life. Mm. So it, it breaks my heart actually, when I think that people who are caring are, are leaving the workforce just because they don't have that bit of flexibility. Mm. And so when we talk about supporting working carers, and um, I say the, the thing we've done is treat end of life as important as beginning of life. It, it's, it's really quite simple to me. And um, you, know, you, can, you can take your policy and I encourage every business here to take the policy that you have for parental leave, duplicate it and write carers at the top. Uh, you, have, you can take six months off unpaid with the right of return. You can go for medical appointments. You can, you can actually say I'm a carer and I bring this wealth of time management and experience and um, emotional intelligence to my job. We did, we did some work um, looking at customer outcomes and satisfaction. And where there was an intergenerational team, it was more successful. Mm -hmm. And where there were people who could talk with experience um, of what some customers were going through, it worked even better. And, and um, Annabelle, I think you'll, you'll probably be in a position to, to speak with more authority on this. Um, but if you're talking to somebody who has power of attorney, end of life, and um, you, it helps to have an understanding of that. So carers is just one part, Tina. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. it's we've got increasing longevity that creates different challenges and it requires businesses to look at what they're doing and how they're doing. Absolutely. Uh, Annabelle, did you want to come in on that point as well in terms of also how APSA are sort of thinking about this? I, I agree. I think that's a good point. I think the, the thing that we're driving at here is what levers are there in society that can make for a healthier longevity it's not longevity itself that's the problem it's the amount of time that people may spend in in health ill health mm -hmm. so if it's possible to reduce that impact i think the wider things we're talking about is all these preventive measures that may have an impact whether it's air food smoking activity um, the particular point about allowing carers um, greater opportunity to deliver their responsibility and businesses finding a way to do so, I, I, do, I agree, I think it's particularly important. Um, there must be a way to solve that problem. And I think I hadn't thought of it that way before that using people's insights, particularly for those customer instances can bring a unique um, view to that situation. Um, it's something we encourage with our teams anyway to deal with customers and colleagues with empathy. I think anything that improves that process is a, is a good thing. So good Absolutely. to just thank you. Yes, and uh, there's a question here from Jose, um, which kind of links into this notion around health giving you the, the, the ability to enjoy life, passion and purpose. Uh, why not think about staying healthy for long to be able to stay productive and creative is more of an opportunity than a threat to pensions. Um, uh, John, would you like to talk about that point? <laughs> well, I think it's a very good point. Uh, and and it, it goes back to the point that, that Mary was making about, uh, uh, about an aging society. Um, it is in very much in everybody's interest that people are, are, should they want to, and if they're able to, that they, they, they can work for longer and be productive for longer. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of research which suggests that at least some types of work are good for your health and your mental health as you get older. 
you know, I'm not talking about sort of extreme physical labor or anything like that, but, uh, but remaining engaged and busy is, is a lot better than sitting at home doing nothing. Um, I just, just to pick up on, on, on the carer's point, mm. it, it, most people, when they think about care, uh, think about you know, resi residential care in nursing homes and so on, or domiciliary care with meals on wheels and, and carers coming in. The huge, the, by far and away, the largest part of the care uh, world, if you like, is the voluntary informal side, which is done by families and typically by women. Uh, and uh, that is the bit we need to encourage. And if we do that well and enable that to happen better, we can delay quite often the start of engagement with the formal care system till later in life, which is usually the right outcome for the individual concerned. Yeah. And it also uh, is very much economically the right outcome because as anybody who's ever tangled with this in their own family will know, care is enormously expensive at the end of life, as well as enormously distressing once you get into the formal system, it can be. So if we can encourage the informal system to work better, then that is a great thing for business to do. Absolutely, um, points well made. Um, so I'm gonna turn, there's a couple of more techn technological questions, which I'm gonna keep in reserve just for the moment. They came through quite early, uh, but we'll get to them. Um, there's a question here on, uh, are there any overarching health themes um, worth businesses focusing on, such as tackling obesity? So now obesity I know has been in, in, the, in the news for all kinds of reasons. It's obviously a hugely important issue. We know Boris has been quite, um, uh, vocal about how um, you know how it's uh, impacted uh, what he re reckons is his risk to to COVID that he suffered from. Um, so we've got uh, so obesity increases the risk of a range of uh, illnesses. Uh, I'm just reading the, the question here from the from the Q and A. Um, and is something businesses can influence as employers through the goods and services they provide and through their influence externally, including through their advertising media liaison on lobbying. So absolutely. So I'm gonna to turn to Jess and just to see to what extent obesity specifically has been a focus of your campaigns and how you are tackling that. Yeah, thanks Tina. So we, we run the Healthy Markets Initiative over at Share Action, which is specifically focused on tackling childhood obesity actually is where it came from. Although lots of the things that we do are, um, can help all people to, to live healthier lives and to access healthier diets. Um, but we know obesity, along with lots of similar issues, plays out very unequally uh, for the rich versus the poor. And people on lower incomes tend to be much, much more at risk of uh, obesity and, and children from families on lower incomes tend to have much higher uh, obesity levels. And, and actually, although, um, you know, people often argue that it's about individual choice, what all the overwhelming evidence tells us is that individuals haven't particularly changed over the last sort of 50 years, but the environments that we're living in have changed a lot. So we are now flooded with opportunities and incentives to eat less healthy food um, and generally the healthier products, certainly the healthier products that are also convenient um, have a price premium placed on them. And so that's why we're working with the supermarkets and the manufacturers in the UK to really encourage them to make it as easy as possible for all people to access those healthier options. And I suppose to the, to the kind of broader question, we'd re I'd really encourage businesses kind of listening into this to think about what is their unique ability to contribute to health? So often you find businesses will do um, kind of corporate social responsibility type activity, um, which is sort of separate from their core operations mm -hmm. and usually can drive best impact through their core uh, operations. So if you're a food business, don't focus on doing a nice activity campaign on the side do reformulate your products mm. and think about how you're marketing those. Um, you know, if you're a big employer, do think about, are you paying the, the minimum wage? Do you, you know, are your workers on secure contracts? Um, do they have access to, to sick pay that enables them to take time off to self-isolate or whatever they need to do? And so really I would encourage businesses to think about those fundamentals first. 
Absolutely. It's this whole thing. It's about don't just talk the, talk the talk, but walk the walk. And needs to be fundamentally a whole way of doing things. Um, so um, absolutely, that's that's uh, fantastic. And just a quick word. I mean, you, I think you're allowed to 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 kind of um, uh, uh, you know we want we should we need to toast you to some of your recent successes. Just and perhaps you want to tell a little bit this morning what uh, was in the news today. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So um, in the news today, uh, Tesco have announced that they've uh, both, well, in the news a few weeks ago, they set a target to increase their sales of healthier food options from 58% to 65%. Um, they'll be doing that through a range of things like reformulation, marketing, positioning in store. Um, they announced that just three weeks after we filed a shareholder resolution um, with them asking them to set those targets and to, to uh, report on them um, and just today they they've announced following kind of further discussion with us that they will extend those commitments uh, or commitments on health to their booker group who own a, a bunch of uh, kind of convenience right. stores and others um, and also to their central european business so um, we think this will have a real um, positive impact on health and we hope it will shift the rest of the market as well yeah. Fantastic, Jess. And we know there's so much attention on this. We know, um, and indeed, we spoke at the launch last uh, month, Henry Dimbleby is coming out with his national food strategy, the white paper in the summer. So there's a lot of attention on this. And I think consumers, you know, hopefully become much more knowledgeable and informed about the issues at stake. Um, so I'm going to, um, did anyone else, um, perhaps Annabelle do you, or, and Mary, do you want to pick up on the point uh, on the obesity focus or other focuses of yeah. health that we need to be uh, dealing with? Uh, Mary? So um, not about obesity, if that's okay. Just, okay, no, that's fine. I think, the, I think the question was, what are the sort of macro trends that could be yeah. thought about yeah. for businesses? And I would pick up on musculoskeletal um, strength because that, as and somebody was mentioning Marmot in the chats, mm. what Marmot report clearly showed is that the earlier you start to engage, the better the long-term extra years of healthy life. So if we can think about the way that we design things the way that we use things and what we can do to encourage musculoskeletal strength from um, the design of your office or the the way that you structure things or your products and services I think that is something that absolutely every business can take some action to improve so that was that was my point there no, and you raise a really good point. I know the data is pretty clear that musculoskeletal and also mental health, can, especially depression, especially with COVID have been the major um, sort of areas that businesses have had to sort of um, take on. Uh, Annabelle, do you want to come in on that point? Because I'm sure you will have seen this through your own data and, and the focus on what you're doing. Indeed, I think obesity is one of the big challenges for society to look at what is the best way to tackle it? I think the, the good news on it is the, the ways to tackle it have wider impacts than obesity. So to the previous point about better physical activity, better musculoskeletal health, some of the remedies, the remedies are fairly common. A better diet, healthier from all angles, better physical activity, all of these things contribute, I think, to the different end goals people want. Mm. And there, there's also lots of evidence that better physical activity in particular also contributes to mental health mm -hmm. and if I added one more thing I'd say it's probably and there's plenty of research about it that work is good for people in itself so a healthier business is putting relevant to their workplace I think that's very important whether you're whether you're a transport business an insurer a hospital a school what you do in your workplace is different but those actions you take will help the health of your staff and if you have a healthier workplace it's better for business as well i'm afraid i don't have the the right answer for actually tackling obesity but i'm optimistic that the actions we're taking on the other things should contribute to that absolutely and also i think uh, john i remember you making the very good point that you know even in our large you know public sector who employ many many millions of people they have their part to play as well john i don't know if you want to make a point there <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, this is really a point about positive, constructive collaboration between public and private sectors. And, you know, sometimes when you look at big societal issues, you know, there is a kind of 
uh, attempt to, to, to get business to fix the whole thing. I, I think that this is a problem shared, if you like, or a challenge that can be distributed across all parts of the economy. And you know, it would be great uh, if, if public sector organizations could show the way uh, on things like healthy canteens, uh, on helping their workforce uh, be physically fitter, as, as well as being mentally fitter as well. Uh, when I was a civil servant, um, it was, uh, we talked a lot about mental health, you know, the Stevenson Pharma Review, which we commissioned and so on. Um, it was always, let's get business to do this and not, uh, well, what happens at the, uh, at the department over the road, <laughs> you know, the other civil service departments. So everybody has to play a part. Absolutely. Thank you, John. So I'm going to turn, there's been a couple of questions that speak more to um, sort of uh, how business can support local communities. And I know this is an area that John and, and I know Mary are very um, passionate about as well. Um, I mean, indeed, all of us. Uh, so there is uh, one question by uh, Joel, a key way for business to think about their contributions to health is through a place-based lens. And of course, if you were there at the launch last month of Leveling Up Health, that was a really, really big point that Chris Whitty made, actually. We also have, of course, the ONS National Health Index, which is measuring health more from an asset-based perspective, look, um, healthy lives, healthy people, and healthy places. Um, so businesses are rooted within communities, wherever they are. Will the index consider factors such as more local procurement benefiting the environment as well as the local economy? So that's just something to keep in mind. And then a more a related question from Michael, um, oh, sorry, from, uh, again, from Joel as well. Given employment is a key determinant of how can large businesses do more to create vacancies or, or set minimum hiring coaches from people from more deprived local areas? So those are two interconnected questions. Um, who would like to have a go and answer how, a, how, we could, how the business index could support uh, more of this place-based approach? Mary, it looks like you were... You know? so I was scratching my back. The oh, sorry. <laughs> I to go uh, first. John, um, do you want to take, uh, take that question on? Because I know you're yeah, sure. quite a lot of work in this area. Um, sure. I mean, I mean, it, it's very interesting if you read uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot's uh, reports, you know, a decade apart about this. And, you know, the place is massively important. And, you know, where we have health inequalities, you know, there are inequalities by definition in different places. So um, the built environment and place matters a lot. And that goes right through from housing. If you live in terrible housing, it's likely that you will be less healthy. It correlates also with you probably being poorer. But so it's a complex mix, but housing is really important to this. Uh, the design of communities, towns, cities is important to this too. We need to have the right uh, open spaces. A lot of our towns and cities are still designed really in the 1960s for everybody to go everywhere by car. You know, that's not very helpful. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done locally about, uh, about these differences in health outcomes. Really the, the designers of place, uh, I think would be well advised to try to design in the healthy option as the obvious or the simplest option. You know, too often it's not, it's just easier to do the unhealthy thing. So I think this is a massive subject and there, there's an awful lot to be done. But, you know, alongside diet, where you live seems to matter a great deal to what your health outcome is going to be. I'll, I'll stop there because otherwise I could go on for far too long. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is. Anyone else who'd like to take on that question? Yeah, well, a slightly different aspect on the same thing. I think yes. um, as businesses and small, uh, larger businesses in particular, we've got a great deal of focus on diversity and inclusion, and rightly so. Mm. And one of the things that uh, we're looking at in Phoenix is, well, what's the, what's the social mobility aspect of that? Because as John said, you know, we, we see um, a correlation between so many of those aspects of low health, lower income, greater proportion of ethnic minorities in those areas. So if we are looking to drive um, more diversity in our businesses, and if we are looking to improve social mobility, I think we should put those together and that will have um, an outcome that enables better health. If you think about people with disability, you know, it's all of those things mm. are compound together. And what I'd like to suggest to businesses is that we start looking more holistically at some of these those issues and I could talk more about supply chain and things but I'll stop there too. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm just keeping an eye on the chat is why I see Kate Adern is here, um, who's, who's, uh, been, uh, who's been leading the way in the in the Wigan um, positive examples in, in Wigan. And she, she mentioned the local government association are doing some really interesting work. And as it happens, we're very, um, we're in contact with them concerning the leveling up health report, of course. Um, so just, um, I'm going to turn um, a little bit to some of the technology sort of questions. Um, so our first, uh, and very glad to see some, you know, uh, public health consultants on the line. Um, so we have a question from Angelica Cabela, um, uh, who's a health, public health consultant. What strategy, which strategies have been developed to introduce genome sequencing tools in order to prevent and design strategic preventive campaigns? So this is a really interesting area that I know the APPG is looking at. And I know there's some really interesting um, partnerships being formed, looking at epigenetics and, uh, and how to, to encourage and incentivize and nudge people towards healthier behaviors, et cetera, working with um, some big um, uh, organizations, you know, working with employers to improve health and well-being um, amongst the workforce. Uh, so um, HealthCRM and, and Ludo being one example, for example. Um, but I don't know, Annabelle, would you like to um, talk about, you know, the sort of the, the sharp end of technology, sort of genetics, epigenetics, how that's factoring into some of your future thinking and, and indeed your current offerings? The genetics area that we're particularly focusing on, um, if I took one area, is really the step change in cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. So understanding of both the genetics of the person and the, ge the genetics of the cancer helps with much more targeted treatments. So for me, that's immensely encouraging. And some of the findings there really are that cancer isn't just sort of one thing there are actually many types of breast cancer, many types of colorectal cancer. They're all genetically different. And then how somebody responds is different. So I think the work that the pharmaceutical biotechnology industry testing as well as part of it is, is a really key step change. But treating things is quite a long way down the line. AXA and myself as well also are very keen on prevention. If there's more you can do to intervene early, to prevent things happening where possible not everything is preventable that also makes an immense difference so are you looking at sort of the sharp end of things like you know polygenic risk scoring things like that or how are you sort of we are, you see yourself really, getting involved really, in the prevention really practically what we're looking at um in terms of funding cancer treatments um, we rely on the NHS testing directory mm -hmm. so if something is listed there that means we can fund um, drugs and tests in that particular instance. So that's particularly helpful to help our members get better treatment. Mm. Um, I, th I think it's an emerging area. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a related question here, and this is a question for all, um, uh, asked indeed by, by the same person. Um, does the business community, um, do they have developed, have they developed clear pathways to introduce new technologies? So this is a question about, um, yeah, they're, they're, the way that they've structured themselves to, um, to enable and foster innovation using and adopting new technologies. Um, I, I don't know who'd like to go first. I know, John, I know you've been doing, your group has been funding and looking at this with, with the Advanced um, Care and Research Center. So I don't know if you want to take on that question first. And, I'll, and Annabelle, looks like you want to say something there as well. John, do you want to yeah. go first? And I'll Sure, sure, Tina. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we uh, sponsor is, is work done in Edinburgh University Advanced Care Research Centre, which is about uh, looking after older people and developing better models of care. And, you know, what, what comes across really strongly uh, from that work is uh, the poverty of data there is uh, around older people and uh, in, particularly those in the care system. You know, if, if you asked a government minister, you know, how many people are there in the care system, they would not be able to give you an accurate answer. If you asked who, who are those people who'd absolutely have no clue. Mm. Uh, and if you asked, how do you aggregate the, the medical data, which might help those people, again, it's terribly disjointed. There's all sorts of uh, IT challenges and, and, and things about natural language processing and all the rest of it, really complicated. The other thing that comes out of that work is, you know, not just to pick up bit on what Annabelle said, you know, there's a huge scientific advances on specific illnesses, but quite often with, with people in later life, you get multi-morbidities. Yeah. And, you know, it's very, while we can measure 
how many people have broken a hip last year or how many people uh, had a stroke. You know, you, you don't have a general measure of frailty. And what tends to happen is these morbidities accumulate, people become more and more frail. They are prescribed a drug for a particular condition that has a side effect, they're prescribed something else to offset the side effect, they then have another condition. So you have a huge amount of prescription going on and they gradually decline. And as one of the professors in Edinburgh put it to me, they die of stuff. You know, there isn't a kind of single cause. So as well as the, the, the super scientific work on, on genetics and everything else, uh, I think we do need to get a really good understanding of the person in context as well. Absolutely, person in context, so important. Um, Annabelle, you wanted to um, come in on that. Well, I will comment on the innovation, but just a, a yes. small comment on the last piece. I, <clears throat> I agree with the, 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 the frailty index. It's not a formal index, but certainly if you speak to many doctors and nurses, they will agree that there's just too many things that have an additive effect on someone. But to come to our earlier point that somebody so eloquently made, actually the impact of carers at that point, that is something I would see as it's not truly preventive, but it is an action perhaps we're not taking um, seriously enough at the moment. How mm. much can carers help reduce the frailty index, help support vulnerable individuals at a time in their life where they need more than ever good care more than technology is increasingly i think where we're thinking and axa has an interest in that we have a company called taking care which aims to support people at home through technology and get them better contact with their families um, but that was just a quick comment there the adoption of new technologies and innovation i think is an interesting one because if you speak to most people they do want the latest state-of-the-art test treatment the counter to that is I think we need a, a more adult conversation about how do you introduce new technologies to market? How do you ensure rapid innovation, but responsible testing? How does it become more normalized for people to be part of trials, perhaps, rather than individual experiments? Mm. So approaching that from both an economic point of view and an ethical point of view, I err uh, certainly much more to that step forward for all of society and for individuals, a willingness to be part of trials is I think really key. And perhaps that's one thing that may come out of the COVID experience. Mm. You know, vaccines have gone through trials, that sort of approach, I do wonder where we will take from that. So really interesting point. And I think um, equity in trials and making sure that we are um, carrying out research on all the populations we should be, including disadvantaged groups, are, is such an important issue here. And there's a, a, um, it, um, uh, and there's a question here on uh, tackling health inequity, which I'm going to, so I'm gonna open, um, open up a discussion around that. We've got in left behind areas with fewer businesses and with more SMEs overall, what role can businesses um, take to make sure everyone benefits from their good work tackling health inequities? So I think health and inequalities is a massive issue. Um, and I know uh, is something at the heart of all the work that we're doing the APDG and is very much the focus of what the index is also trying to do. Um, can I just go around? Because I, I, I can see we've only got seven minutes and I also want to, to go around tackling this one question, but also as part of your answer, what are the three things or up to three things that we can start doing now to level up health and, and obviously focus on the role of business? So who would like to go first as we go around on this very important question? Should I pick one? I'll, I'll go okay, first. Annabelle, you carry on. The other willing volunteers. Um, I think all of us have a responsibility to go back to the organizations we work in and encourage stakeholders we work with to put health on the same agenda as green and carbon. And then from there, have a think about what that business can do to make a difference. So I think my first thing would be get health on your business's agenda. The next thing to think about is come up with a plan and how soon can you take action? And then the third area I'd look at is try and involve employees, involve your people in it. Because people are part of the change. Businesses are part of their local community. So bringing those people with you and their ideas, I think, is key. So an engagement exercise, I think, is what I'm what I'm talking about. 
So, and, and then the question here in left behind areas, and of course we've got our local elections tomorrow, don't we? Uh, with fewer businesses and with more SMEs overall, what role can businesses take to make sure everyone benefits from the good work tackling health and inequities? So, um, so that's the question I know at the, the, the end of the Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna go, uh, go continue to go around. Um, should I go, who would like to go next? Yeah, I can jump in. Jess. I think on the on the health health inequality and, and trying to kind of level up, particularly in those left behind areas, as, as you say, and, and even within areas where you know that that may be seen as uh, quite wealthy, there's often real disparity. So I think for businesses, this is about looking at the evidence of what works and not necessarily taking the easy path. Mm -hmm. and, and it comes back to what I said earlier, that we time and time again see businesses doing um, sort of social media campaigns, marketing, um, for want of a better word, marketing gimmicks uh, around kind of uh, educating people into being healthier. And the reality is that, that most people know, broadly speaking, what is good for their health and what isn't, but they struggle to do it. So they need help and they need help from businesses to do that, to make the healthy choice the easier choice, whether that's food or exercise or whatever it is. So I think really being quite thoughtful about um, what you as a business, what your unique contribution can be and where you have uh, a unique influence based on you know, what products, services, uh, types of workers you have. Um, and, and in terms of the, the kind of key thing, I, I'd, my sort of call to action for, for businesses more broadly, I think there's something about setting meaningful, ambitious targets that can be measured. Mm -hmm. So about how you as a business can improve and contribute to good health disclosing those targets and committing to monitoring uh, progress and, and being transparent about that as you go. We think that if all businesses can, um, can, can set those targets, can be open and transparent, that will create the right environment to, to drive progress at scale. Fantastic. And this whole piece around measuring what matters and the metrics and transparency is, is a theme clearly that we are going to be really looking at hard with the business index work. Um, Mary, can I turn to you next? Mm -hmm. Just checking, I was off mute. Yes, I, I think it would be um, amiss of me not to say that one of the three actions people should undertake the business index to understand where they are. Um, so I think we, we would all agree with that. Um, I think the second action would be to look at the company purpose and responsibility and think about how health aligns to that. Um, in particular in the context of the ESHG, um, I don't think they can be unpicked as a separate piece there. Um, and the third piece would be to look at your colleagues because that's your, um, your colleagues, your community, your customers. If you get that going in the right circle, um, you'll get to a good, a good place. As to the left behind, oh, that's a really tough one. It's really tough because, um, I'm, I'm not an SME, I guess I can't, I can't speak with that knowledge and experience. I think what bigger businesses can do is look at their supply chains and ensure that there is a living wage, appropriate practices going all the way through and whatever size business you, you have, that should have a, um, a positive impact where you can. But unfortunately, I, I can't solve that whole left behind piece. John, I'm gonna, we only have a minute or so left. Uh, there's the final question here. How can we make sure that in the transition to you know, post-Brexit, fourth industrial revolution, post-COVID, how can we make sure that health doesn't get squeezed out in the transition? So. Well, the, the, the obvious way is to try to uh, build this ESHG approach. Uh, it has to become mainstream in the same way that climate has become mainstream uh, and that means we have to develop the right metrics because if things don't get measured, they don't get reported, they don't get done. That's the lesson of TCFD reporting from climate. So I think that's that's the main thing. And just to pick up on the, on the supply chain point, which uh, I agree with Mary about, most SMEs sit in the supply chain. Uh, bigger businesses should not. 
uh, be able to push the negative externalities of what they do up or down the supply chain. So we need to look after the, in the interests of our cleaners and receptionists and people we outsource just as much as we look after our own employees. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Mary, Annabelle and Jess uh, for a fantastic discussion. I think we're out of time. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Matt. <laughs> fantastic. Thanks, Tina. That's uh, impeccable timing there as well, just on the uh, on the top of the hour. Uh, a very big thank you to, to you, first of all, for a, a brilliant job of, of moderating the session and also to uh, all of our panelists for what I'm sure um, our, our viewers will agree was a fascinating and, and very important discussion today as well. And hopefully uh, viewers have got some, some useful takeaways. Uh, so yeah, thanks everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you to everyone that's taken part.